Hi, this is Daniel and you're watching Collab Crush. Uh, today we're going to be starting a multi-part series on Cisco's Expressway servers. So we're not going to be doing any configuration or anything like that today. Uh, instead, we're going to be laying some groundwork and talking about some key concepts that are necessary in understanding the Expressway series. So let's go ahead and get started. So as you may know, Cisco has two products available that seem to perform the exact same functions. They're the Cisco Video Communication Servers, or VCSs, and the Cisco Expressway Series Servers. So what are the differences between these two servers, and when should someone choose one product over the other? Cisco acquired the VCSs from a company called Tanberg back in 2010. Now, Tanberg was a video telecommunications company that supported video only as a mode of communication, but the VCS was and still is capable of supporting both SIP and H.323 communication protocols. And Tanberg also offered an ISDN gateway for IP to ISDN communications and either an MCU or telepresence server for multipoint communications. And then the TMS server was used for easier management of the entire Tanberg solution. Now, the VCS came in two models, the VCS Control and the VCS Expressway. The VCS Control was located inside the corporate network, and all internal devices would register to the VCS Control. So this included both SIP and H.323 endpoints, uh, MCUs, uh, telepresence servers, and ISDN gateways. The VCS control also supported a SIP to H.323 gateway so that these two protocols could communicate with one another. And then two different VCS controls could communicate with one another across a WAN using a trunk called a neighbor zone. Now the other model of VCS called the VCS Expressway was used to traverse the firewall and NAT servers at the edge of the network. This allowed endpoints inside the corporate network to communicate with other businesses outside the network over IP. The VCS Expressway was located outside the firewall, either on the public internet or within a DMZ, as depicted in the slide. The VCS Control and VCS Expressway could communicate with one another using a special trunk called a traversal zone. This is still a viable solution under the Cisco Collaboration solution. Now, because the VCS Expressway operates exactly like the VCS Control, endpoints located outside the corporate network could still register to the VCS Expressway without the need for a VPN connection into the corporate network. The Cisco solution prior to the Tanberg acquisition looks something like this. The primary call control mechanism was the Cisco Unified Communications Manager, or CCM. The CCM supported SIP and Skinny only, but you could register video endpoints or voice over IP phones. Multipoint communications was delivered through a product called the Cisco Telepresence Multipoint Switch, or CTMS. PSTN access was possible through the Cisco Unified Border Element, also called Cube, or through PRI ports on the iOS routers. Now, intercluster trunks could be established across the WAN between CCMs for a more unified network, but there was no way to traverse the firewall or NAT at the edge of the network. And then there were other devices available with a Cisco Unified Communication Solutions, such as voicemail through the Cisco Unity Connection server or instant messaging and presence through the IMP server. Now, once Cisco acquired Tanberg, they had to make some immediate changes to the network topology by blending certain elements of the two solutions. So for starters, the CTMS server was retired and Cisco went with the MCU and telepresence server for multipoint conferencing. The ISDN gateway was retired and Cisco went with Cube or iOS gateways with PRI cards for IP to ISDN access. The VCS control was recommended for H.323 endpoint or third-party endpoint registration. However, the CCM was Cisco's choice for the primary call control server. All SIP endpoints and voice over IP phones could continue to register to the CCM as they had before. Starting with version 8.1, Cisco introduced a new pair of servers called the Expressway Series, which were based on the VCS firmware. Now, these servers have the same menus and the same capabilities as the VCSs, except that they can't support direct registration from endpoints. Instead, Cisco came out with a new technology called Mobile and Remote Access, or MRA, 
which allows endpoints or uh, voice over IP phones outside the corporate network to proxy their registration to the CCM through the Expressway Core and Edge without a VPN. Now the Expressway Core and Edge servers are free applications that you can download and use uh, for all Cisco customers who have purchased a certain licensing. Now the idea here is to offer some of the VCS capabilities to CCM customers without the need to purchase all the licenses that coincide with the VCSs. However, any customers who did purchase the VCSs can still set up MRA without needing to deploy the Expressway Core and Edge, since the VCS Control and Expressway perform the same functions. Now, this is a point that seems to confuse a lot of people. Prior to the 8.9 software for the VCS and Expressway series servers, the ability to register endpoints was the only real distinction between these two products. Now, when Cisco released the 8.9 software for the VCS and Expressway series servers, either server could then support direct registration for H.323 or SIP endpoints. Now that that distinction can no longer be made, it's difficult to see what the difference is between these two products. So the difference is licensing. The VCSs use device-based licensing, whereas the Expressways use user-based licensing. On a VCS, you must purchase the number of registration licenses required for the number of devices that you're supporting. This means that if a user has a desk endpoint, for example, at work, and an endpoint at home that needs registered, then two device registration licenses must be purchased for that one user. However, on the Expressway servers, a device registration license is provided for each personal device a user has, so no extra licenses have to be purchased. You can add room registration licenses for meeting room endpoints that are not associated with one specific user. In both cases, these licenses support SIP or H.323 endpoint registration. Now, on the VCS, you also have to purchase call licenses. Now, these licenses are specific to traversal or non-traversal calls, so an administrator must also understand the differences between these two types of calls through the VCS. Now also, these licenses have to be purchased on a VCS where the calls are local between two registered endpoints or a business-to-business -business call. On the Expressway servers, local call licenses are included at no additional cost on the server. But if you want to add B2B calling capabilities, you'll need to purchase a rich media session license, also called RMS licenses. Now RMS licenses allow B2B calls across the firewall. Uh, calls to customers using Jabber guest services or calls to Microsoft clients such as Skype for Business. You don't have to specify how the RMS license is being used, but the services do need to be set up on the Expressway before the calls will work. Now, no RMS license is required for calls between two endpoints registered to the Expressway server uh, or calls between two endpoints registered to the CCM calls between an endpoint registered to the CUCM and an endpoint registered to the Expressway server, calls to CMS or video mesh node conferencing infrastructure, or calls to Cisco WebEx cloud services. Now Cisco user licenses can be purchased using two licensing models. Now user connect licenses or UCL are typically purchased by voice only Cisco customers. UCL Essentials and UCL Basic don't offer any Expressway capabilities. However, UCL Enhanced or Enhanced Plus licenses do offer Expressway capabilities and two devices per user. Cisco Unified Workplace Licenses, or COOL, C-U-W-L, are the other user-based license model. There are three purchasing options with COOL licensing. Uh, as you can see from this diagram, the differences between them are the added feature capabilities that are included, such as the Unity Connection and Conference Meeting capabilities. So now that we can see the differences in the products, let's look at when each product should be used. Now for customers who will use video communications only and have no need to support voice over IP phones or other voice related services such as Jabber, soft clients, or voicemail, the Cisco VCS Control and Expressway are the ideal servers to use. Also existing customers who have already deployed a VCS should plan to continue to use their current solution even if a CCM is added to their network topology. However, for customers that do need to support voice over IP phones or other voice related services, or if these customers ever plan to use these types of services, 
then the Expressway Core and Edge are the ideal servers to use. Also, existing CUCM customers should consider deploying the Expressway Core and Edge for an IP traversal and MRA solution. Okay, hopefully that'll serve as a good foundation and we can sort of understand the differences between the VCS and Expressway servers. Uh, if you like this video, give it a thumbs up and subscribe if you haven't already. Otherwise, that's it for now. I'll see you in the next one.